The Lord be with you. Good to see everybody today. Boy, what a difference a week makes, huh? Last Sunday was pushing 100 degrees, and now we're into the nice Ventura County cool fall season, it seems like, which will probably make it really nice for next week's outdoor uh, barbecues, elder barbecues. So more on that on the uh, other side of the service, but we're looking forward to that. In the meantime, today we have a wonderful feast of God's Word and God's sacraments. So we'll feast on that today, and we'll start off with a lovely hymn. Please rise for that. Come thou almighty King, God bless your worship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. Consider how I love your precepts. Give me life according to your steadfast love. Humble yourselves before God, confess your sins to him, and implore his forgiveness.
God be gracious to you and strengthen your faith through a repentant heart and by your sincere confession, trusting in Jesus' own righteousness, all your sins have been forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated for a hymn of praise. From Psalm 116, read responsively, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and pleas for mercy. The snares of death encompass me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. Return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Please rise for prayer. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, our support and defense in every need, continue to preserve your church in safety, govern her by your goodness, and bless her with your peace. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings.
The Old Testament lesson on the 17th Sunday after Pentecost comes to us from Isaiah chapter 50, verses 4 through 10. The Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught, that I may know how to sustain with a word, with a word him who is weary. Morning by morning he awakens. He awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. I gave my back to those who strike, and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting, but the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who will declare me guilty? Behold, all of them will wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them up. Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the voice of his servant? Let him who walks in darkness and has no light trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. This is the word of the Lord. The epistles from James, chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they may obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives? Or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise in honor of our Lord Jesus for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the ninth chapter. And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and the scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to Jesus and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him. Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And Jesus answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, Immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell down on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. 
And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And it has often cast him into the fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for the one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out, and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, He's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And Jesus said to them, This kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise you may be seated for a hymn of the day and let the children be dismissed to Sunday school. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we talk about the peaceful transition of power, right? During an election year, however, it's especially easy to see the human heart's hunger and lunge for power. It's all around. No names. There's enough power grabbing to go on both sides and probably on the part of some third parties as well. So it's not only the candidates themselves. In an election year, what better opportunity exists for ambitious upstarts to make a name for themselves by raising lots of funds through unwanted texts to those poor one-time donors? 
And Underling's career could also gain ground by landing that perfect slogan that slams the opponent when they're right where they're weak, but really shows off one's own candidate uh, and his strength. In such ways, a lower level flunky can seize the moment and watch their own career rise to relative power in the lower ranks. That is, if they don't get eaten up first themselves, lost in the frenzy, or shot by so-called friendly fire. It's a mad, mad world, isn't it? And not so different, really, from ancient times. After all, the human condition, what we bring to the table according to our sinful nature, that hasn't changed since the fall. There's nothing new under the sun. And with all our politicking, we still are coming up short. That's the truth. So I'm not saying don't vote. Yes, go ahead and vote. But ultimately, mankind, mankind's hope is not in his vote. As we turn to our gospel text this morning, one could argue that the stakes were even higher way back then for Jesus' disciples in their campaign to see Jesus crowned as Messiah. Their hopes were pinned to Jesus as the one who would deliver them finally from foreign occupation, that is, from Roman oppression. And for such a promising messianic candidate to come along, like Jesus of Nazareth, it was literally thousands of years in the making. So those are pretty high stakes. As we follow them along in the middle of Mark's gospel, what the disciples fail to see or keep in mind, like so many fellow oppressed Israelites, is that Jesus is already anointed as the Christ, the Messiah, and not by any national officials, but by his heavenly Father and by the Holy Spirit at his baptism. And furthermore, Jesus is already on his way to be crowned king. Only his coronation will be not with the regal gold and jewels in his crown, but rather with the thorns and thistles of the curse on this entire creation. Knowing what a shock to their senses this kind of coronation of suffering will be to his disciples, Jesus has already started to brace them for it. Mark records three such passion predictions given by our Lord, one in each of chapters 8, 9, and 10 of Mark. Our recent readings happened to skip all over uh, chapter 8 of Mark. We didn't get any of those, and they really would be a little help to set the context for today's gospel. So let me read a portion or two from chapter 8 that we missed. Quote, Jesus then began to teach his disciples that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed and after three days rise again from the dead. There's the first passion prediction. Now, how do you think that went over with the disciples? You might already recall. It was met with that most famous, or should I say infamous, of replies by the disciple Peter. Mark 8.32 says, And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, him being the Son of Man, that is, Jesus. Peter began rebuking the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Now, how do you think that went over with the Son of the living God? First of all, I wouldn't doubt it at this point, that all the other disciples immediately took shelter behind a rock or a tree or something to hide behind and cringe. Then I will let Mark again describe the scene. But turning and seeing his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but rather on the things of man. Ouch! I'm sure that one stung for quite some time. Does that sound harsh? How could Jesus call Peter Satan? And whatever happened to Jesus, meek and mild, anyway? Last week, he called the Gentile woman a dog. 
And this week, Peter, Satan. This was the Simon Peter who right before this just answered the $50,000 question correctly when Jesus asked his disciples, whom do you say that I am? And Peter spoke up and said, you are the Christ. And then Peter went from being teacher's pet to being the devil in 0.6 seconds. That seems quite abrupt, doesn't it? It's abrupt, it very well may have been, but not quite as abrupt as you might at first think. You see, back there in Mark 8, Mark was setting you up for a little bit. He was setting you up for this sort of two-faced Peter, if you will, and you may not have even realized it. There was a lot happening back there in Mark chapter 8. Uh, when we did that jump from chapter 7 last week straight into the middle of chapter 9, chapter 8 is not really a flyover chapter, okay? Of course, none of God's word is. But the setup for Peter's about face, his instantaneous fall from the height of a bright student's good graces to the low, low disgrace of the dark Lord, small l, this identification. This setup came with Mark's recording of a very unique miracle, not found in any of the other Gospels. And Mark lays it down right before the whole explosive rise and fall moment with the disciple Peter. Okay, so what was that unique miracle then? The healing of the blind man from Bethsaida. Okay, you say, that's not so unique, Pastor. Jesus heals blind men all over the Gospels. Not like this one. From chapter 8, verse 22. And they came to Bethsaida. And some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. So Jesus took the blind man by the hand, led him out of the village, and when he had spit in his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked the blind man, Do you see anything? And the man looked up and said, I see people but they looked like trees walking around. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Well, it wasn't the spittle that was unique, was it? We just saw Jesus use spittle on a deaf, mute man last week, whom he healed first time. No, and the deaf man was totally healed. Since when does Jesus the eternal creator who made the sensitive ear and who fashioned the intricate eye, since when does he need another go at it to accomplish his miracle for anyone? No, this miracle was for the Bethsaida blind man, yes, but the method was for his disciples today as well as back then. And we see this represented by the double-minded, excuse me, the double-minded man from the crowd in today's gospel. And it turns out he's also a desperate dad seeking a cure for his tormented son. So here's the flow of Mark's gospel from chapter 8 to our reading today in chapter 9. Keeping in mind as well, these chapter divisions were a later addition, not until the Middle Ages in the year 1205 AD. That's when the chapter divisions were added into the scripture. So there really is more of a flow between chapters 8 and 9 or any chapter divisions than we give them credit for. A unique healing of a Bethsaida blind man leaves him temporarily able to see things rather fuzzy, but not get a picture that's accurate of the whole scene, right? Jesus then with his disciples asked them a question that up to this point Apparently, some Gentiles were able to understand and answer correctly, but not so much Jesus' own disciples. Peter got the first part of the question right. Jesus is indeed the Christ. But just when Jesus went to build on that as to what the Christ must now go and do, namely go to Jerusalem and die and then rise again, Peter made it obvious that he didn't see that whole picture clearly. If you were to ask him, right, Peter, Jesus is the Christ. Good. Now, what do you see the Christ doing? Well, whatever he'd answer there, 
it certainly was not about dying on an instrument of capital punishment at the hands of the polytheistic foreign invaders of Rome. You could see Peter was very fuzzy on these details, to put it mildly. The next scene in chapter 8, actually this gets into chapter 9 now, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up the Mount of Transfiguration, where he is transformed literally into the light of the world to the pleasure of his heavenly Father, who speaks from a cloud. Now, here, given that scene, you can't blame anybody for the reaction. Can you imagine being up there in that cloud? But Peter, and probably the other two as well, and by the other two, I don't mean Moses and Elijah, who make it an appearance there, but they, all the disciples, must have been completely discombobulated from that heavenly spectacle. But we know Peter was definitely flabbergasted because he, again, is the one who pretty much puts his foot right in his mouth up there as well, bless his soul, but not as bad as his blunder before when he rebuked the light of the world. Finally now, they come down off the Mount of Transfiguration in our reading today and into the chaos and confusion of the remaining disciples' inability to cast out a particular demon. This particular demon had been tormenting the man's son from childhood, trying to kill him. It's a new scene, but an old theme. Notice how Mark, the gospel writer, imports this halfway there, not quite there yet, this twilight zone theme into this chaotic scene. The man sort of complains to Jesus. I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. Jesus, acknowledging now that his time with the other disciples as well, is running out. And he laments that this whole faithless generation is lacking in understanding and trust in him. Evidently, these unsuccessful disciples learn later that they forgot to pray. Who knew? Not a good strategy when confronting the evil one and his minions. Remember always to pray. So to add more doubt to this faithless generation, this man, this father, disheartened by their lack of success on the part of the remaining disciples, he asks Jesus now, if you can do anything, have compassion on us, help us. Well, it's probably not a good day to use the word if. And Jesus says back to the Father, if, if you can, all things are possible for him who believes. That was a sobering summons. Jesus was summoning up from this man whatever mustard seed amount of faith he could muster. And at this point, the desperate father knew he was called upon to believe, not just for himself now, but for his tortured son as well. His paternal instincts kick in, And with strained sincerity and heroic candor, he blurted out, I believe. Help my unbelief. The echo of that transparent prayer would reach the ears of every disciple there that day. And then down through the corridor of time to all disciples of the age of the church, the martyrs, the church fathers, the saints of the Middle Ages, and the reformers. Martin Luther said that we are part unbelievers till the day we die. This is the heartfelt cry of all of us believers in the modern world. These believers who don't yet see, but nevertheless believe, right? We are the blessed one, the resurrected Jesus says, when he told Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet who have believed. This desperate father's heartfelt prayer then is also our confession. Our confession is twofold, isn't it? In keeping with this spiritual twilight zone we live in in our experience, we assemble regularly as a body of believers first to confess our sin. And then, having heard the message of Christ, we secondarily confess our faith. And we use the words of the church's ancient creeds to do it. 
before the one who is the faithful and true. We don't dare feign a faith with nary a doubt. Like this desperate father, there is too much at stake. There are those whom we love and for whom we care who depend on our faith to be strong, to role model it, to hold them up in prayer and to seek the Lord on their behalf. We don't dare try to pull the wool over these little one's eyes or the all-seeing eye of the Lord before whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Yes, he calls us out of this faithless generation and he calls us out on our lack of faith at times, doesn't he? But don't miss this. At this desperate father's honest prayer and confession, our faithful Lord did take pity upon him and on his tortured son. To that stubborn demon that wouldn't come out except by prayer, Jesus commanded it to come out of him and never enter him again. Jesus commands it, and the demons must obey. For Jesus is the one to whom we pray, right? It stops there with a compassionate Christ. Even when Peter in his own half-healed blindness rejected the blessed gospel of our Lord's death and resurrection, the compassionate Christ that he confessed still invited him up to the Mount of Transfiguration with him, didn't he? And to all of us today, whose conviction is wanting at times and whose faith does falter. Your compassionate Christ, whom you confess, still invites you to his table where he strengthens your faith and he nourishes your faith. So in that faith, you may be preserved steadfastly until he comes again. And not only you, but for all those who count on you to be strong in the faith. What's that? You confess you don't all the time feel very strong in the faith? Your confession is heard. And for the reply, I'll let St. Paul take this one. We have Christ's all-sufficient grace. It's his power that counts. Therefore, I delight in my weaknesses. For when I am weak, he is strong. Amen. And now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. Amen. And now we do have that opportunity to confess our faith, having heard the word, in the ancient creed. Today we'll use the confession of faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. Please rise with me and confess our faith. I believe in one God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all the world. God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten and not made, being one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men, for our salvation, came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. may be seated as we continue our worship with the offering.
Please rise for the offertory. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord God, we believe. Help our unbelief. Sustain us through the many troubles and trials of this world. When unclean spirits afflict us and those that we love, revive their trust in you. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you have given your beloved Son the tongue of one who is taught that he may know how to sustain with the word those who are weary. Prosper in every place the preaching of your gospel, we pray. By your spirit, enable your pastors to proclaim the word with clarity and joy, and by the same spirit that opens ears of your children to believe it with gladness and with action. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, guard the tongues of our governing authorities, especially in our native land, our president, our state officers, our local officers as well that they may not stumble in what they say, but speak wisely, leading in accord with your will. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, you have promised that all things are possible for one who believes. In such faith, we bring now in the silence of our hearts those that we name. Lord, for all these and others who have need for you, we ask that you would grant them health and healing. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, we know that your Son is near in his holy supper, giving in his body and blood his saving righteousness for the forgiveness of our sins. Grant repentance and faith to all who come to this table today, that they may welcome him with joy, praying, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, Heavenly Father, we gratefully remember the sufferings and death of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, for our salvation. Rejoicing in his victorious resurrection from the dead, we draw strength from his ascension before you, where he ever stands for us, interceding as our own high priest. Gather us together from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us, for to you alone we give all glory, honor, and worship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Also Lift up your hearts. We give to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, right to give it is truly good, right? and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing.
our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And when he blessed it, he gave it to him, saying, Take and drink. This is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for the remission of all your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. May this true body and true blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and sustain you in the true Christian faith to the life everlasting. Go in peace and with joy. Your sins have been forgiven. Please rise for the post-communion canticle.
Grant, O Lord, that what we have received with our lips, we may keep with pure hearts. We thank you that through the gift imparted to us in this present life, we receive life everlasting through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his everlasting peace. Amen. Amen. May be seated for our closing hymn. Good to be with you all today. Um, we do have a few distinguished guests. Uh, Dennis and Tara, where are you? Um, retired pastor and his lovely wife. And over there, another retired pastor with his lovely wife, Eric and Nancy. Can you guys all stand so we can applaud and thank you for your careers? And Dennis, so I was going to say before we sit down, I don't know if you want to make an announcement, but I, on the front side of the service, I talked about the elders' barbecue, but you can make next weekend just to eat it out all, all throughout the whole weekend because the um, Hispanic Mission Society. Did you want to do an announcement or no? Sure. Yeah, come on up. So, um, oh, uh, there's a, another pastor I want to mention. He's not here, but we're doing a door offering for Pastor um, Nelson. They Paul Nelson from Santa Barbara. Yeah. So now he's doing some education. We're not supposed to use the M word, but it's education globally. So we want to remember him with the door offering as well. Linda.
As the bulletin uh, announces, next Saturday is the blood drive, and it's from 9.45, or 9.30 to 1.45, so you will have time to donate blood and then go to the there celebration up in Goleta. Um, I will be outside taking signatures, and I want to thank everybody who responded to me this past week and signed up for a spot. Thank you. All right. And don't forget to look at that little insert. That's the flyer for the Elders Barbecue. And you can, if you don't know, you can find out who your elder is uh, next Sunday after service. Anything else that needs to be? Yeah, Sandra. It's that time of year again when I ask for help to raise funds this year for our uh, local youth, high school youth group to participate in the National Youth Gathering, which I believe is in New Orleans. New Orleans, my favorite venue. New Orleans venue. next July. So we will be doing our annual pumpkin festival on Saturday, October 26th. From 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. is the actual time of the festival, but we will be needing help beforehand setting up and cleaning up. And right now we are needing local pumpkin growers. Uh, last year, my husband and about three or four other men traveled uh, about six hours one way <laughs> to pick up pumpkins. <laughs> and they were heavy, he says. And so, we want to try and support a local farmer and not put on so much wear and tear on the, our own personal vehicle. So if anybody has any idea where there's pumpkins to be had, please let me know. Or if you would like to help the Day of the Pumpkin Festival, let me know and I can sign you up for any job. There's no, no job too great or too small. We all could use your help. Thank you. Great, hey, thank you, Sandra. Can they grow pumpkins or is it too late? I think it's too late. Oh, okay. All right, well, before we get going too late, uh, have a wonderful week. Remember when you're weak, he is strong. God bless. <laughs>